Eina, you are the Dean of Industrial Design Engineering in Delft, is that right? That's right. What does that mean? Well, that means that you try and educate a lot of students and at the same time you try and uh, make, yeah, let your people make time to do research. I remember from a previous life that you once upon a time actually sold light. Yes, I did. <laughs> yes, I did. Now you give light and pass it on to the students. I wish you good luck on a white spot. Thank you very much. Enjoy the year of light. Thank you, Rogier. What is light when we don't see it in the dark? Um, it's actually the contrast with the dark that uh, makes light. And then one of the things that's maybe something we find hard to imagine, but I, I stayed in a, in a house in the east of the Netherlands, and that's a house on a sand road, and there's no street light, and there's a lot of quiet. And usually when, I, when I'm there, I sleep like a log, because I'm not disturbed by anything. And uh, it's really dark at night. And one night I thought, oh God, my family again, they didn't switch off the light outside. So I got out of bed. Uh, to switch off the light because I think it's a nuisance to have it there. And when I got out of bed, I actually noticed there was no light on, or there was light on, it was full moon. And it's fantastic to see when you come out of bed how much detail you see and how much your eye can actually capture. So it was one of the things that we, these rare occasions that we all, I think, should, should search for in order to enjoy light. And this is, I think, a picture that shows a little bit what something like this can look like. It really is amazing. So sometimes in a, when it's a nice bright night and full moon, try and find a really dark spot and enjoy. This is a picture that is uh, close to it. A lot of children don't like uh, to be in the dark because they can't see things coming and they think all sorts of things are coming. The funny thing though is this little article on the left hand side is uh, I think it's sold by IKEA. It's called Spuka, so it's actually called Ghost. Um, but the kids love it, they cherish it because it gives them comfort that uh, nothing strange is going to happen. And then we have something like a light body for children that are too small to read the clock. And when the moon is in the belly, they must understand you shouldn't disturb your parents. But when the light, when the sun rises in the body, it's about time to go and play with them. This is another example that, uh, that I came across that is, um, of course, there's a lot of people in the world that sort of live off-grid. They don't have electricity, so they don't have light at night easily. Um, and of course, we designed lamps with LED that doesn't need so much energy. So with a solar cell, you can charge it in the day and then use it in the evening. Very nice project. However, there was one problem when we launched it. It was fantastic for these people to have light, but they were somehow disappointed because they wanted to go an aspirational level further. They said, I need this space on the table in order to make my home work. I'd rather have it hanging in the, in the sky or hanging it on the ceiling. So actually the design was not good enough. We had to do it all over again because the light shouldn't shine around, but the light should have come out of the bottom. So whenever we start with light and we have light, we really have only started. Then there's also something that I found with the color of light, which has got to do with culture. And this is, uh, yeah, in the north of Europe, we like yellow light, yellowish light, because it's cozy, it gives us a good feeling. In southern Europe, sometimes they don't mind to have GL light in a restaurant. And why is that? I don't know. Maybe it's because during the day they are used to more light and they like to have more light. And the picture that we see here is actually a picture from Hong Kong. On the mainland in, uh, in, in China, there's a lot of bluish light because they use the compact fluorescent uh, light. Um, but on the other hand side, in Hong Kong, you have a lot of Westerners that have a different type of light. And this is the mix that is currently there. And it's fascinating to see each time I get there, the mix is a little bit different. We used to see more yellowish light coming in, but now that the borders are open and, uh, and Hong Kong is more Chinese, you see also a lot of blue light coming back again. Fascinating to watch. Now, another thing I would like to share with you is light is something we can measure. And you can treat it from very... Uh, yeah, from the physics, more of the logical manner, but our mind usually doesn't do so. So what you measure, measure is not necessarily what you perceive. There is a translation in the middle. And this is an interesting picture. If you look at the two pictures on the left-hand side, it's exactly the same picture, turned 180 degrees. But it looks very different, doesn't it? And that's got to do with the fact that our brain knows and thinks light always comes from above. And then it, it changes. Um, if you look at the bottom right-hand side, I think that's a picture from the surface of the moon or Mars or so. Exactly the same picture turned around. 
the bubbles become hollow bits and vice versa. And I think the, the one on the top right hand corner tries to explain it a little bit better. Um, a bubble and a dimple, you can make look the same, but the light has to come from a different direction in order to do the right translation in your mind. There's another way, that, another thing that I would like to see, I hope it's going to work. We tested it so it should. This is a, a vacuum formed face. And um, I'm going to show you, just watch it, and I hope you're going to see it, what you see when I turn it around. So this is the normal, the normal face that you expect. But when I turn it around towards the back, you see, when things are going well, you see something funny happening. Is it visible? So all of a sudden, this hollow part of the face is standing out to you. That's got to do with how we translate it. And I, th I don't think we have uh, discovered that uh, yet um, well enough, what we can do with that and how to deal with it and how to design with it. I think telling you this, one of the things I think is when you have more knowledge, it feeds creativity, so you can come up with new ideas. And we've only started, I think, with light to discover this. Another example, which is done by somebody in, uh, in my faculty, Sylvia Pont, and on the one hand side, she's looking at yeah, what physically it means having light, and on the other hand side, what does it do with us? And she found that light is usually um, yeah, built out of four components. And uh, one of the ways in which I try to understand what it means, because you can make very difficult calculations, as you showed them to me, it's pages full of formulas, and to be really honest, I find that a little, a little bit difficult. But there's four levels of light in a room, and that's why I brought this bigger one. Maybe it gives you, gives you some more of a better view. The first of all is the ambient light, and that is generic light, as diffuse as it can be. And the best way for me to describe it is skiing in the mist. And when I would be skiing with this in the mist, I bet you don't see the dimples. Maybe you do not even see the ball, but certainly you don't see the dimples, which is on the left-hand side. Then you can be in a spotlight, and in the spotlight, you know exactly in your translation where the light comes from. And then you can have spotlights from different directions, from the top and the bottom. And if they are totally uh, I said in, the, in the same direction, but coming from the other side, something happens. And the last one is actually just a reflection from the space you're in. It, it's determined by the shape of the space you're in, by the quality of the surface. Is it shiny? Is it not shiny? And um, so we, we, we try to make a prop. And, um, I've been walking around with this for a couple of weeks in my pocket, and I really start to see it. And we call it the beam catcher. So if you want to understand more of the light, what actually is happening? The, the ambient light is the, by far the largest component, and all the other things are details. But when we talk about the light, we usually start to talk about the details. But that's not the thing that gives us the biggest impression. So I, um, I, I, I honestly believe that if, you, if we have more knowledge, there's better ways to design. And now I know this, I'm sure if I would do the lighting in my house, I would do it differently. Talking about the lighting in your house. I do not know when you last moved house. I did a couple of years ago. And then you go to these stores, and sometimes you have these electricity points just popping out of a ceiling somewhere. What shall I hang there? And they come out of these stores totally, utterly confused. There is so much choice. And of course you can say, I like that shape, I don't like that shape. But you actually hardly ever think about the light. You think about the luminaire. And then when you dig in a little bit deeper, you have, you have so many types of lamps. You have uh, plafonnières and you have hanging lamps and standing lamps and spotlights and direct light and indirect light. And then when you go to the bulb shelf, it's more or less the same thing, but different language. And then you have these different fittings also. So it is a really a challenge for consumers to find the right solution. Um, and when you go to, also in the language, it's interesting to see that different languages use, use different words. So there's no straight translation. And when you want to talk about light, actually you miss language. There's a lot of things that you can't express. And we need knowledge and a common language to get more out of it. And when you go shopping for these, it's, it's even more amazing because then you have all these cultural aspects coming in as well. Do you want to be really grand and you choose the one on the left? Or you want to do the same thing but be much more modern? Then maybe you choose the one on the right-hand side. And everything is sold and everything is used, but by different people. Until I learned about this rule and then I really start to understand a little bit more. 
Actually, when, design, when you design light in your house, you need to consider three levels. First of all, it's the ambient lighting. The lighting to make sure that you know where you're going, you can see what you're doing. This is the generic one. Then you need task lighting, because sometimes you might want to read a book, or cook a meal, or do your homework. And then the last level, which is also the, probably the last that you design, is putting um, emphasis somewhere in your room. You might have a beautiful painting, you might have a beautiful area in your house that you want to give some extra light. And once I understood this, I looked at my house very differently and I thought, oh, there is a lot to improve. So I, I think having more knowledge actually uh, gives us a lot of things to go for in future. Then I haven't even touched upon the new era that we can use with LEDs. LEDs, well, you, you all know they're very small, and I have this little box which sometimes still comes in very handy. And this, you know, these are uh, six LEDs, so small it is. Red one, blue one, green one. Then you have the colors of the white, three different colors, becoming whiter all the time. This is just one, one LED, but I'm sure you all will have been able to see it. And it's electronic, and electronic means you can tune it. With an incandescent lamp, you couldn't. The first um, uh, energy-saving lamps, you couldn't even dim, and they sometimes had this grayish light, and when you have them outdoors, it takes five minutes actually before it's in full power. We can guide it, we can give these lamps an IP address, they can talk to each other, and these things are going to come up. And then you can do even more. You can connect your thermostat to it, and maybe your, your, your fridge can give you the signals you're running out of milk. Uh, or when you have a Facebook message coming in, the lights flash, and you have something else to do. All these things are in the future, and we need to explore. Some of these things you might think is nonsense, but some of these things likely will add value to our lives. And this is a picture, um, for some of you, maybe very familiar. I looked it up on the internet, I found it fascinating, and later on I actually found out it was a design by Rogier, Rogier van der Heide, and I, I thought I'll leave it in and say thank you very much for having me here today. I do hope you're all going home with a few ideas and a slightly different view on the lighting at home, and that you tonight think, hey, there are actually things to do, more to learn. Thank you very much.